Ever heard of a film about a guy who decides to leave society and live in the mountains? It's a real gem from 1972. This movie is full of surprises, from funny moments to some that might just leave you shocked or even a bit sad. It's a roller coaster ride you won't forget. Now, you might be curious about some interesting facts or stories related to this film. Maybe it's inspired you or left a mark on your life somehow. Share your memories or experiences with us in the comments below. We're all ears. So, grab your popcorn and get ready for an adventure with this classic flick. You're in for a treat. In the world of Western films, there's a certain charm to stories that take us into the wild, where survival and solitude intertwine. This particular movie, despite its slower pace and sometimes confusing scenes, manages to draw viewers in with its breathtaking scenery and moments of tension. Following the journey of a lone individual navigating the rugged wilderness, the film relies heavily on visuals rather than dialogue to convey its message. However, this choice can sometimes lead to confusion, especially during scenes like wild wolf attacks or encounters with Native Americans, where the editing feels disjointed. Yet, amidst these flaws, the movie delves deep into the protagonist's psyche, showing how the harsh landscape shapes his experiences and decisions. It's a story that requires viewers to read between the lines, understanding the character's journey through subtle cues and actions. The accompanying music adds to the overall cinematic experience, enhancing the emotional depth of the story. Despite its imperfections, the film offers a fresh perspective on the Western genre, focusing more on character development and the challenges of isolation and survival. In the end, it's a movie that leaves a lasting impression, inviting viewers to reflect on the complexities of human nature and the vastness of the wilderness. And despite its flaws, it's a journey worth taking for those who appreciate a more nuanced approach to storytelling. Adapted from two sources, the movie takes inspiration from real and made-up stories about a man named Liver Eating Johnson in the Wild West. These stories were written in the late 1950s and 1960s by Raymond W. Thorpe, Robert Bunker, and Vardis Fisher. They serve as the basis for the movie story. Early in the movie, there's a scene where the main character is trying to catch fish with his hands, and he's carrying a special kind of gun called an English cape rifle. It looks like a double barrel shotgun with one barrel for shooting straight and another for shooting a wider spread of bullets. This type of gun got its name from its use in the Eastern Cape of South Africa during conflicts between British settlers and local tribes until the early 1880s. As the movie unfolds, you notice that the main character, Jeremiah, used to be in the military, but it's not explicitly mentioned. There are hints though, like when another character, Bear Claw Chris, sees Jeremiah's striped pants and asks about the latest war. Jeremiah avoids giving direct answers, showing that he's not too happy with his military life. Later, when they're on a mission to save stranded pioneers, Jeremiah asks Lieutenant Mulvey about how the war ended, suggesting that he might have considered deserting. These little details added into the story give you insights into Jeremiah Johnson's past and the conflicts he's dealing with on the inside. Amidst the rugged wilderness of a remote mountain area, a complete flathead Indian village was meticulously constructed against the backdrop of ancient archaeological discoveries. Crafted with authenticity, the movie precedes Robert Redford's The Candidate, yet strategically releases after in December, coinciding with the fervor of the 1972 US elections. John Milius, initially compensated with $5,000 for his screenplay, saw his earnings soar to approximately $80,000 through subsequent rewrites. The narrative unfolds, weaving a tale of survival, resilience, and the pursuit of freedom in the untamed frontier, captivating audiences with its raw portrayal of the human spirit against nature's unforgiving landscape. Scouting for filming locations, especially those inaccessible by road, required aerial exploration. Many scenes were shot on or near Robert Redford's Utah property, spanning about 600 acres. Some locations, however, stretched as far as 600 miles away. To add authenticity, scores of American Indians from northern Utah were enlisted as actors, extras, and background artists. Their presence lent depth and realism to the film, enhancing its portrayal of frontier life. The integration of local talent and landscapes contributed significantly to the movie's immersive experience. It's a testament to the filmmaker's dedication to authenticity and detail enriching the narrative with genuine elements of the American West. During the filming of the movie, the temperature plummeted to as low as 25 Fahrenheit. It took about three months to find the right actress for the role of the swan, Jeremiah Johnson's Native American wife. Originally, Lee Marvin and then Clint Eastwood were considered for the role of Jeremiah Johnson, with Sam Peckinpah set to direct. However, due to conflicts, Peckinpah left the project, 
and Eastwood opted for another film. Warner Brothers then picked up John Milius' screenplay and cast Robert Redford for the lead role. With no director attached, Redford convinced Sidney Pollack to take the helm as they were looking for another project to collaborate on. The narrative of the movie unfolds like a journey up and down a mountain. Along the way, he encounters various individuals akin to waypoints on a mountain trail. The climax of his journey lies at the graveyard, situated atop the highest point in the film, the mountain pass. Much like the ascent and descent of a mountain, the pacing of the journey reflects this pattern. It marks the film debut of Josh Albee. Robert Redford expressed his enthusiasm for performing his own stunts in the film, stating, I like the tough stuff. Half the fun of making movies is doing the action scenes. Anyone can say words. Don't get me wrong. The stunt guys are really necessary, and I never do the stunts where a pro can pull it off safer and better. But I do like to do the action where the camera is too close to tell a lie, and the movie's insurance men are back at the office making out policies. In the wild American frontier, a man named John Jeremiah Garrison Johnson, famously known as Liver Eating Johnson, left a lasting impression. His interactions with the Crow tribe earned him a gruesome nickname, while his adventures were documented by real figures like Bear Claw, Chris Lapp, and Delg. Sidney Pollack, the creative mind behind the 1972 film, initially imagined Johnson as a legendary lumberjack, a modern-day Paul Bunyan with a love for chopping down trees. However, this portrayal changed during the journey from script to screen. The film's music, an important part of any movie, followed an unusual path. Warner Brothers Records delayed its release until 1976, leaving fans waiting. A form of redemption arrived on October 5, 2009, when film score monthly revealed a restored and extended version of the soundtrack, allowing audiences to enjoy the film's musical background once again. In the extensive story of Johnson's life, where battles with nature and other people unfolded, these historical elements and cinematic decisions combined to shape the narrative we now recognize. The production of the film encountered its share of challenges. Writer John Milius clashed with Robert Redford and Sidney Pollack, resulting in his dismissal. Milius asserted that subsequent writers struggled to replicate his style, with only Edward Anhalt making a notable contribution. After Anhalt's departure, Pollack and Redford brought Milius back to complete the script. The character of the crazy woman in the film draws inspiration from real-life events. According to the book Crow Killer, she was a resident of Wolf Tail Valley who endured personal tragedy when her children were killed and her husband was taken captive. Mountain men such as Liver Eaton Johnson, Delg, and Anton Sepulveda sought vengeance on her behalf. There are tales suggesting that Hatchet Jack may have been her husband, driven mad after being scalped and tortured by Blackfoot Indians. Johnson acknowledges the possibility of his return if he managed to escape. In the film's credits, gratitude is expressed to various authorities for allowing filming in several natural locations, including Uinta National Forest, Wasatch National Forest, Ashley National Forest, Zion National Park, and Snow Canyon State Park. 